Bueno, pues. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm surprised to see so many people today at the end of July here in Madrid. I don't know if you are back from your holidays or if you are about to leave. I've uh, literally just landed back in the city and I'm very happy to be here today with James and everyone else today. I suppose that if you're here, it's because you know his um, career a little bit. I'm going to be make a very brief introduction and he will take the floor for 15 minutes and I I just want to be brief James Williams was wicked for working for a full decade in the strategic department of Google he even received the founders award which is an award that only the best employees can receive. And the next thing he did was leave the company and start thinking about Google, the way Google was destroying our lives. He quit Google. He left for Oxford. And uh, from, Ox from Google, he moved to Oxford and where he did a PhD about philosophy and ethics and technology. And um, this was the time where the computational department in Oxford was founded, I believe. Is that right? I'm speaking to him in English, but he should be listening to the translation. He's, he was, uh, back then, the, um, the computational department in Oxford was created, I believe. And I don't know if you were there at the same time. And after working on his PhD for several years, he received an award that allowed him to uh, write this book that was published in 2018. And the title was Stand Out of Our Light. And this uh, referred to one of his favorite philosophers, that was Diogenes, who was the original troll. And as everyone knows, he said to the most famous man in antiquity, um, Alexander the Great, that when he came for him to acknowledge his prestige and uh, give him whatever he wanted in life. Diogenes told him to step up away, you're uh, blinding me uh, from the sun or you're, you're, you're in the way of the sunlight. And he wanted to tell us that maybe we should tell all the powerful platforms to step out because they are uh, taking the light of the sun of us or as he says in his book the freedom for us to choose where we want to focus our attention and the type of people that we want to become and where we're heading for this book has just been translated into spanish it's been published by gato pardo publishers the new title is the title of one of the three parts of the book it's a very interesting book, especially nowadays when we are so used to talking about the platform's issue about extracting data and the addictions that they create. Obviously, his view is more based on philosophy and is related more to the attention that it steals from us and the trade-off that we have to do in order to uh, receive emails and get messages from our friends and be able to follow the head headlines in Twitter and see pictures in Instagram or videos in TikTok. What are we trading for this or what are we giving in exchange? Now, James is going to um, make a presentation, uh, 10, 15 minutes, and I'll leave the floor to him and then we can have a chat. Hello, James. Great. Well, well, thank you, Marta, um, and um, thank you all for coming today, taking time out of your day, uh, especially on such a, a nice day, but I've heard you have a lot of nice days in the summer <laughs> here in Spain. Um, thank you to Telefonica for uh, the invitation to be here today, um, uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge my gratitude to, uh, to Lucas Villavecchia and uh, the team at Gattopardo 
uh, Ediciones for uh, for bringing uh, my uh, my book into your your wonderful language. Um, I grew up in Texas and studied a bit of Spanish, and uh, but I, I feel like your your English is <laughs> most of the time probably better than my Spanish. Um, and in addition to the translation services, I feel like um, I can be more precise in English. So thanks for indulging my giving this uh, this talk in, in English. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so the book has recently come out in, in Spanish, and um, it's been three years since this book came out in, in English, um, and it's those three years have felt like about three decades, I think, um, and I'm, I'm sure at least the last couple of years have felt like longer than two years for many of you. Um, I think so much has happened in the world, not only with you know this weird new health kind of uh, situation we're all in, but, but even in the context of these, these issues around tech and attention and, um, and the, the power struggles, really, um, that, that we're, we're all collectively engaged in with, with, with technology, uh, there, there, there's been an enormous amount, amount of change. Um, so what I thought I would do here is not, I won't speak for, for too long because I'm interested to get to the conversation. Um, I thought I would just kind of briefly sketch the, the general uh, outline of the book, uh, the general thesis, um, and then secondly, just reflect on uh, a few of the changes that have happened in the last three years since the book came out. How has this landscape uh, shifted? Um, so... Uh, so if there is an overall point to this, to this book, so as, as Marta mentioned, the, the book came out of uh, an essay contest called the Nine Dots Prize, uh, and you submit an essay and then get a book deal if, if you win it, and I was fortunate enough to, to, to win it. And, and the title, or, sorry, the question that, w that was asked was, are digital technologies making politics impossible? Um, and, uh, excuse me. So, um, so th that's where the book came out of, uh, and uh, and it, it sort of built on the research that I had been doing at uh, at Oxford. You know, my experience with digital technologies and and advertising in the tech um, in the tech uh, world at Google. Um, so, I think if there's an overall thesis or point to the book, I think it, it's essentially that you know this state of affairs that we call the attention economy where these technologies that we use every day, trust to guide our lives, are you know, competing for our attention and persuading us toward various ends, that, that this could be the major moral and political challenge of our time. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm coming apart here. Uh, so uh, so, uh, so it, the narrative uh, of the book as a whole is... Uh, so it's essentially that attention at the end of the day is, is what most of our technologies are ultimately manipulating, managing, uh, as opposed to information. Um, you know, then attention, as William James said, you know, is the, the, fundamental, uh, the fundamental effort of will. So if attention is essentially the, the core of... <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, so uh, attention is what is being managed, manipulated by most of our technologies we use. Attention is kind of the core of of human will, um, and and if will is the basis of the authority of government, then what is being manipulated, managed, in many cases undermined, is the basis of the authority of government. Is um, something that makes politics. Uh, if not impossible, then extremely precarious in our time. So, kind of the longer version of this, it, it, it starts with, you know, this observation by Herbert Simon, the cyberneticist economist in the 1970s, um, who you know, made this observation in an academic paper that um, when information becomes abundant, uh, it's attention that becomes the scarce resource. And it's a, you know, it, it was kind of a passing observation, but it... Um, I think that it's one of the more profound observations of the last 50, 60 years, because I think that it, 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 captured, it captures the kind of experience that we've had collectively with our information technologies um, that necessitates a, a shift in how we view them. Um, you know, we still call, you know, 
our technologies, information technologies. We talk about a lot of the issues that they present in informational terms, uh, whether that's you know privacy, misinformation, fake news, um, you know all these kinds of things. It's the idea that that's the core thing that they're managing is that's what's going through the pipes is information, and and it is in a sense. Um, but when it comes to the way in which these technologies have impact on our lives and, and what new kinds of responses, new habits they demand of us. Um, I think it's, it's this focus on attention that, that is actually much more important. And so, you know, I use this, uh, this metaphor of Tetris in the book a few times um, to ask, you know, what, okay, what does it actually mean that information is abundant now? Um, and I say, you know, it's kind of like, it's not just that there's more information than ever, uh, you know, you've seen statistics, there's like a new one every day, like how exponentially information is, is increasing in our world, but it's, it's also the speed at which it comes at us. So not just the volume, but also the, the velocity. Um, and so, you know, it's like with Tetris, yes, there's an infinite number of, of blocks waiting off screen for you to, to manage, but, but when it gets hard, when there's a challenge of self-regulation, and the whole, the whole challenge of the game is when those blocks speed up and go faster and faster. And so, essentially, the idea is that in our time, you know, uh, we're, um, sorry, in our time, we're, we're kind of playing this game of Tetris with increasingly speeding up blocks of, of information. Um, and so what this means then is that, you know, the challenges of, of the digital world are challenges of self-regulation. And so, you know, the digital technologies aren't the only things that cause challenges of self-regulation. So, you know, the, the kind of collapse of existing cultural institutions, um, the habits, the rituals, the, the systems that we would, you know, use to guide our lives, you know, in modernism and then in postmodernism, um, and this kind of hyper-focused on individuals, you know, being able to chart their own course, which, it's, it, which is fantastic and has been very empowering in so many ways. Uh, but it, it, it's kind of required us to, as I say in the book, to bring our own boundaries. Um, and, uh, and so what that means is then there's, there's much more kind of responsibility, much more effort, much more work required on, it, on the part of an individual to get back to that place where you were sort of you know, competent and um, had everything structured just right to, to kind of live your life the way you want. Um, James, sorry, yeah. but just wait a second. Since Is there another like, microphone? You know, no. <laughs> let us change your mic because I think you got the slippery one. <laughs> Computers are, the technologies are fighting back. Great. All right. All right. Um, so it. Uh, so this idea that the, 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 an abundance of information uh, creates a scarcity of attention and that creates uh, a fundamentally a, a challenge of self-regulation. Um, and so the, on top of then this new challenge of self-regulation where um, you know, there's all these new things required of us, you know, the technologies, you know, technology could be sort of helping us deal with those things, but instead the incentive structures, um, the, you know, the economic models, uh, the, the designs, um, you know, are the knowledge of uh, psychology that has been developed uh, and cataloged over the last 50, 60 years. All these vulnerabilities in, in our, our, our cognition and decision making, um, it, it, they're kind of systematically exploiting them in this, you know, persuasion industry or per term persuasive technology is often used. Um, and then you add to that the kind of the existing persuasion industry that, it, that was existed in advertising uh, prior to the internet. Um, and you just kind of have all of these things emerging or all of these things colliding in, to create uh, a technological environment that doesn't help us deal with these challenges of self-regulation. It actually amplifies them, makes them even worse. And so the idea is that this is happening at the individual level. It's, and we talk about it in things like distraction or, uh, you know, uh, interruption, um, but also at the level of, of uh, society, the level of, of communities. Um, and so part of the problem is, is the, the power that these things have to persuade us, but, but that's not alone isn't, isn't a problem. It's, it's essentially the, the misalignment of the goals and incentives that, that these technologies have uh, with what our goals and incentives are. Um, so, you know, if, if the, uh, the goal of a platform is to get you to spend as much time 
using it, you know. Um, I mean, I, and I ask this question, I think every talk I give, and I've never met anybody yet who, who says yes, but, you know, I don't think anybody's goal is to use Facebook, you know, as much as they can in a given day. So the thing that the system sees as success for your life, it, you know, it's not actually success for your life. So there's just a fundamental gap between, you know, the goals of these systems that we trust to guide our lives and the goals that we actually have for ourselves. Uh, so, what I say in the book is that, you know, these aren't just differences of degree. It's not just a slight dialing up of, um, you know, uh, the persuasion industry or, um, or kind of, you know, political propaganda. Uh, there, there's a difference, a, 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 the, there's a point at which the difference of degree becomes a difference of kind in the same way that there's a point at which, you know, a rainstorm becomes uh, a hurricane. Uh, so, uh, it, when you also add to this, the, the, you know, the, the centralization of of power that, that these systems have over human thought, human behavior, um, there's a kind of centralization that, that we don't even have to, have to have a name for it. I think yet, uh, a kind of power, um, you know, it's more than a government, more than a religion. You know, to be able to shape uh, the the very intimate cognitive habits of of billions of people on the planet, it's a kind of power that has never existed in human history. And then, you know, you add to this the immense resources that some of these entities have, the, the, um, the algorithmic um, power. Uh, so, so there's no historical precedence. And, you know, when, it, when Churchill said the empires of the future are the empires of the mind, I think that's kind of where we are now. Um, and so, you know, th there are people who have sort of warned us about this, this path, in, you know, in the last, you know, few decades. Neil Postman was, of course, one of them, um, and I allude to him in the, the initial um, section of the book, and, uh, you know, he talks about Orwell and Huxley uh, and kind of different ways in which they saw what the actual threat to human freedom in the future would be, um, and he says, you know, Orwell feared that th there would be people who would ban books. Huxley feared uh, that there would be no reason to ban them because there'd be no reason, there'd be nobody who wanted to read them. Um, Huxley f said in Brave New World Revisited that he thought we'd fail to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. And so, you know, when I was working in the tech industry and I saw the, where the industry was going, I saw the effects of these systems and their dynamics on my own life. Um, I, I felt that, that, you know, we still were taking, failing to take into account our infinite, uh, infinite appetite for distractions. Um, and so one thing I wanted to do in my research uh, and in the book is to kind of deepen our sense of what is at stake. Because, you know, in addition to thinking about these things in informational terms rather than attentional terms, I think w another thing that we've tended to do is, is think about attention as a very kind of surface level phenomena. And so I, earlier I said I wanted to usually connect I the idea of attention with the idea of the human will. And so to do that, I, I used a, a framework um, that is kind of is based on Harry Frankfurt, the philosopher at Princeton, his uh, view of the structure of the human will. So if we want to deepen the, the, the idea of attention to understand what's at stake, um, you know, it, it, on one level, the way we normally talk about attention is uh, as the spotlight of attention. So the way that we manage our awareness in the task domain. Um, so then that involves things like distraction, interruption, fragmentation of attention when technology is frustrated. Um, but uh, so I identify t what I, I call two other levels of attention. Um, so it, it, the starlight is what I call it, the second level, where um, it's not just about doing what we want to do, but being who we want to be. It's about living the lives we want to live. So it's not just how do I accomplish a task, an immediate goal. It's about how do I pursue a longer-term goal? How do I live by the values uh, that I want to live by, you know, navigate my life by the stars of, uh, of, that I want to navigate them by? Um, and so, you know, this gets into the realm of the way technology can create habits in us, um, the way in which it can get us to, um, you know, start to value certain things uh, more than they ought to be valued, which is a kind of pettiness, um, the way in which it can you know, especially in kind of like social media platforms, get us to kind of prioritize the pursuit of status over, over you know, other types of pursuits. Um, so, so things that make it hard to, to be the people we want to be. 
And then the third level is the, I call the daylight. So this is not just about pursuing a goal or living by some value or pursuing a longer term goal, but it's about um, b being unable to want what you want to want. So, um, so not just how we pursue a goal or value, but how do we define it in the first place? Uh, how do we think about thinking? How do we reflect on uh, what we want and why? How do we reflect on you know, the values we want to live by, our relationship with technology? Um, so this is the, the, the domain of you know, reflection, metacognition, you know, imagination to a large degree. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of, you know, Frankfurt calls them second order desires. Um, and, and they kind of represent a certain kind of cognitive complexity that um, you know, print media was pretty good at helping us maintain and advance, but you know, instantaneous, um, fragmented digital media, I think, are uh, they make it much harder for us to to pursue these things. And so the idea is that you know, if if at the end of the day, what makes us human is our ability to kind of keep bootstrapping ourselves up and you know, moving more and more towards the kinds of lives we want to live, um, the kind of people we want to be, and th these things are more, you know, more often than not being undermined by um, these technological systems, the attention economy, that, um, that this is a threat to, uh, you know, the core of what, you know, our humanity, and in the sense that, uh, to the extent that this is, is um, associated with the human will, it's, it's a threat to, uh, to you know, the basis of politics worth having. Um, so that's a very rough uh, kind of overview of the, um, of the general narrative of the book. Um, and so in the book, I, I, I say that there's, you know, there are no easy solutions to this. There's always a temptation in, in talks about technology to, to say, okay, well, here's the three things you can start doing today. I mean, that's not really, it doesn't really exist here. Um, I mean, to the extent there is, you, know, you could start ad blocking, you could start talking about technologies differently, you could start, you know, organizing with, with others to, um, you know, to advance some political end, but, you know, at, at the level of the individual, individual agency, individual action, um, it, it, there's not much because this is a structural, uh, multi-leveled problem. Um, so there are things that I talk about at the level of, you know, design and measurement, um, ethical standards for, for designers and companies. Um, you know, at the end of the day, though, we, we need better business models. Um, and I think one of them is to rethink advertising. Uh, I think there's a big project that remains to be done about uh, looking at, you know, what actually counts as advertising now. Um, if you actually look at it, like, it's not really, it's kind of everything and nothing does. We, you know, South Park had an episode about this. They've always been a little bit out in front of where I met with my research, actually. Uh, but, you know, everything is an ad, kind of. And it, it's, uh, that's kind of where we're at, you know, when children, you know, instead of saying they want to be astronauts and paleontologists, they say they want to be influencers as their career aspiration. Not even influence for something, just I want to have power over other people. Um, that's, I mean, everything has kind of become an ad in a sense. So, so I think advertising um, from a kind of philosophical level and a, 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 even an illegal standpoint, um, I really think there's an urgency around, around uh, this, this project. Um, so and then I think as finally, you know, in terms of solutions, I mentioned that we could start talking differently about technology. Um, so I think it was um, Gordon Pask said that cybernetics is the art and science of manipulating defensible metaphors. I love that, that quote um, because I think it, it gets at, you know, how, how just like these, these very subtle linguistic decisions and framing decisions shape entire debates. Um, so you know, how much of the debate in the last three, four years about the political uh, implications of, of tech has proceeded on the basis of just, you know, termin like sort of basic terminology, like fake news, misinformation, disinformation. Um, and it, it, it's not that, it feels like a lot of times these terms just come about, they don't even, it's not like we kind of decide that this is the right term. Even the term social media, which I, I probably annoy people because I always say this in every talk I give, but like I just don't, I don't think this stuff is actually social media. Like, it's not designed to make us social. There are other media that, um, that you know, let you communicate with people. The term essentially came about when social media marketing agencies came about because they wanted to, you know, show people how to set up a Facebook profile or something. So, 
you know, it's almost like, you know, in the same way, I don't know if something like this exists in Spain, but, you know, in France, they have that Académie Française where there's almost a kind of cultural curation of terminology, of language. Like, I, it, we almost need something like this for technology, not necessarily in a prescriptive way, like, this is the language you must use, but to say, you know, here is like a, a reflected upon reasonable way to talk about some of these things. I think that would be, be interesting, not just for the technologies, but for, um, you know, the different varieties of influence. I think this is, this is one of the things I've been working on uh, since the book uh, came out. You know, how do we talk about persuasion versus coercion versus manipulation? What's, uh, we need a grammar of influence that we don't have yet. Uh, and then I think language for the nature of, of this form of power, which, uh, again, has not really existed, um, in, 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 you know, in human history. You have to go into, like, mythology, I think, to, to find... I think a reasonable comparison. So that was a very quick uh, run through the, the major um, pieces of the narrative. Um, and then in closing, just very briefly, since the book came out a few years ago, um, you know, when I started working on this stuff uh, for my, my doctoral work, I, I kept thinking, you know, why is this stuff not on the front page of every newspaper every day? Like, we're stuck in this enormous, you know, it's kind of like the matrix. It's like we're, you know, we're this manipulative attention economy. And um, it seemed to me like, you know, and I still believe this, that we can't solve the other big problems in the world. Uh, you know, climate change, I think, being the, the biggest, probably. We can't solve these unless we sort of, you know, solve this first order problem of, you know, being able to give attention to the things that matter in the right way. Uh, it's kind of like we're driving a car and, you know, mud has been thrown on the windshield. And it's like, yeah, we don't want to hit a tree. We, we want to keep going to our destination. But the first thing we need to do is clear the mud off of the windshield. And I think that means reforming the, the media that shape the way we give attention. Um, so so it, it has been heartening in the last few years that the issue has had more awareness. Um, this was, a, you know, in large part motivated by the political earthquakes of 2016 in the U.S. and, and the U.K. Um, there's been uh, more attention to sort of the developmental issues when it comes to technology and children. Um, uh, you know, the political implications of some of these uh, designs, these business models are clearer. Um, and there is an awareness of, you know, certainly algorithmic and AI, uh, that, you know, that happens behind the scenes, the need for that to be, have ethical reasoning uh, and ethical um, thinking that's part of it, especially as it relates to kind of societal outcomes of, of equality, equity, fairness, this kind of thing. So that's, it's, it's, it's definitely gone forward. We've definitely taken steps forward, but I, I think that the big challenges still lie ahead, kind of like Lord of the Rings, you know, the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I think the, the greatest challenges for us here still lie ahead. Uh, so I think one of them is, um, you know, making sure that this, this, this whole project of being uh, critical of, of technology doesn't kind of reverse into a sort of digital populism or a kind of digital mythology where we're fighting these mythic monsters. Um, and more concretely, what I think that means is we need to make sure we're not becoming too content with symbolic victories at the expense of real ones. So, it, okay, you know, Mark Zuckerberg can testify in front of Congress, but that doesn't fix anything. That just makes him squirm and people call him a robot or whatever. Um, the, real, the real issue is going to be when the structural issues change. Um, so I think it, also, you know, there's a way in which, like, even when we start talking about attentional, these attentional problems in society, we end up kind of like pulling the escape hatch and reverting back to informational ways of talking about them. So I think continuing to talk about attention as such as, as the issue um, is important. Um, you know, I think the, the better we can bound the problem and, and describe the problem, I think the, the more success we'll have. Um, you know, there's, some people talk about the problem of big tech, some people talk about you know, antitrust issues, some people talk about fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. And these are all important. I think sometimes they kind of get jumbled together in one kind of sense of the overall crisis of it uh, in a way that isn't, isn't uh, ultimately uh, kind of ap like productive. Um, and I guess finally, you know, in all this, my, my view that this, this issue is, is 
you know, it's probably the, the big moral and political challenge of our time. I mean, in my mind now, I kind of sit, sit this next to the climate change issue as the big challenge of our time. I think if, if climate change is about this outer external environmental crisis that's existential in nature, then I think the challenge of the attention economy, you know, reforming essentially our extended organs of perception uh, is is a kind of inner environmental existential crisis. Um, and so my, my conviction about this has only increased. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would hope that in the, in the, you know, coming years we see in the same way that there's been, you know, an extinction rebellion movement emerge for the history of climate change. I would hope that we see something akin to an attention rebellion movement uh, for this issue of the attention economy. So um, that's my hope and that's a very very quick uh, and very rough overview of, of some of the, the, the topics of the book and uh, things I've been thinking about since it came out. So thank you again for coming um, and for having me, and I look forward to our conversation. Thanks. Well, thank you, James, for that presentation. It was very, very nice overview not only of the book, but of what separates the book from right now. I assume if you published the book in 2018, you probably finished writing it in 2017, maybe even 16. <laughs> so so there, is, there is a long, long years of uh, eternal drama between the end of your book and, uh, and today. But one of the things I was wondering as I was listening to you is, uh, since the book started with a question uh, for this uh, award, is technology making politics impossible? I wonder if, um, if you feel that you would have written a very, very different book if you would be writing it today. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure it would be enormously different. Um, I mean, I think the core, I think certainly there have been, there's much more evidence I would have to draw on today uh, to kind of buttress the, the argument. But I mean, I think the core, the core idea that, um, that this, the attention economy is, is the kind of structural problem that, that leads to various types of instabilities that we're seeing in our individual lives, but also then in, in the political realm, I think it would be I think the core argument would be largely the same. Um, but yeah, but I would have much more recent data to, to pull from. Well, one of the dramas of writing about this topic is that every day you regret having started the book, like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the day before, because every day everything changes. Like I was, I was thinking before coming here of the, of the, um, of the last week's um, NSO uh, revelations by The Guardian and a whole variety of different media and how all this um, hacker uh, collectives that are usually protected or aligned with uh, state actors uh, are are using the the attention infrastructure to uh, to infiltrate and and uh, a domain that that can only be called the cognitive <laughs> the cognitive domain of everyone in everyday life and and I was wondering about this because uh, one of the one of the things that you stated in the book is that you you didn't think that the data extraction problem was was so <laughs> important you thought that the attention problem was way more relevant I wonder if if now you have maybe changed your mind a little bit about that not really I mean I think I, I think certainly issues of of um, you know surveillance of data extraction you know the privacy issue I think these are certainly important issues I think to me I think if we imagine though tomorrow that we we solve those issues like um, we had them all figured out I think it seems to me like we would still have the major the major issue kind of um, before us, uh, you, know, like, you know, to the extent that, that, you know, a lot of data is collected uh, online, I mean, maybe not by governments, but by, you know, companies, um, I mean, it's typically to, the, as, to use as a kind of a, a way of improving or amplifying 
um, either advertising or persuasion, the you know, the competition for attention in some sense. So, um, so my I think my yeah in the book I wasn't trying to say that, that these things weren't important. It's just that you know where they happen in kind of uh, business context, it's it's usually as a means to the end of of getting attention. Um, but then when they happen in uh, obviously, in you know, governmental, geopolitical contexts, it's uh, it's sort of a, a different kind of of problem. Which, uh, yeah, I certainly wouldn't want to undermine or minimize that either. So, um, so yeah. So I think that they're 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 problems. But to me, that that the the core problem is is the the conquest for human attention and the the manipulation of it via uh, you know hyper effective persuasion. That's a very good point, that if, if we were to resolve the data extraction thing, the, the attention thing would still be exactly as bad, uh, possibly even worse. It's just, I heard you at some point use a metaphor that I really loved, and I don't know where it comes from. I was fancying like a Russian story, um, maybe about a woman that lives on a desert island and, and in order to survive needs to... Mm -hmm. You tell the story. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, I think it originated in... Uh, uh, Joseph Raz, the, the political philosopher, uh, his book, The Morality of Freedom. Um, I don't know if he was the first to use this example, but he, he used it in the book. Uh, he called it the example of the hounded woman. So there's like a woman who is um, on a, an island and she needs to do the things she needs to do to survive, find food, build a shelter, get water, all this. But there's this, um, this murderous, rabid dog that chases her around the island, and she has to keep running from it, and so can't do all these other things. Um, so it's it's this uh, this idea that the deprivation of, you know, um, of you know wh either whether willpower or opportunity to to pursue some task uh, is a deprivation of freedom. So even if those things technically existed on the island that she needed to get, um, she wasn't able to do it because her attention was completely taken up uh, by running from this animal. So the idea is there's an analog there in the, you know, in the same way that we have all have things we want to do in our lives, but you know, if there are these various forces competing for our attention, in many cases actually winning our attention, whether it's you know, one more you know, funny cat video or, or, or the latest you know, outrageous political event dinging our phones, that it, there's a sense in which it's it's we're being hounded by it, and, and the deprivation of attention is is undermining our our practical ability to do the things we want. So that's the general comparison there. It is it is very nice uh, comparison, and also like very understandable uh, when you think about you know how every time you try to focus on something, like your brain is eaten away by this phone. <laughs> that is next to you doing nothing really just by existing because um, the machinery that has produced your response to its presence uh, is in your brain already it's not even in the phone anymore like you can quiet it and yet you will still be thinking something happened and yeah. I'm not aware of it in the last few seconds and um, and one of the one of the interesting things that comes from studying what what this, you know, um, uh, slot machine <laughs> kind of effect of uh, smartphones in our in our brain and our capacity to think or to stay still for like five seconds is that it produces the state of um, of um, hypnosis, no? That that um, slot machine players or gamers uh, call the zone. <laughs> like I like when people when people that are addicted to this machine say that they're not trying to make money. Like everybody knows you don't make money from slot machines. Like they make money from you, but mm -hmm. they're trying to get in the zone where their hands are working like by themselves and they're like in a state of hypnosis. And, um, and that state is conductive <laughs> to an extreme power um, uh, uh, of suggestion, no? So uh, that's why I was, I was connecting this um, this this uh, power of grabbing attention and eating away of our brains to to the NSO and and hacking team uh, abilities because while we are in this state we are more vul vulnerable than ever. Mm -hmm. But anyway, one of the things that I really like about your book is that um, you you don't focus much on the on the topic of 
um, the platform's intention. Like you don't, um, you're not so interested in their intention because you think the problem is in the incentives. And, and I think it is, you know, even from a mathematical perspective of how to, re how to resolve this problem, it's a very interesting uh, point of view because it immediately um, zooms out to, um, to reveal like that the, the entire ecosystem of information right now uh, has the wrong incentives and they all center around not so much of technology but around advertising which is the big I guess the big um, monster slash evil of your book so the question is um, how do we well there's I have two questions about this one is uh, how do we uh, make the companies that dominate the attention market um, have the right incentives and also are these companies technology companies or are they advertising companies? Mm. Yeah, well I think to the second question, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the answer is in the question. I mean, like this, we have this category of tech companies, but if you look at the companies that get lumped in there, I mean, they're not usually selling the technology, like they're usually, I mean, usually selling attention in some way, but, but even when we put companies like Amazon next to companies like Google or Facebook or Twitter, um, you know, they're very selling very different things. I mean, when companies sell bananas, we call it banana company, and when they sell oil, we call them an oil company, but, you know, when it comes to these advertising companies, you know, we either call them tech companies or social media or we have some other kind of name for it. Um, so I, I absolutely, th I think that, you know, you know, like I was saying, the framing and the language is so important. I think starting to talk about these companies as advertising companies is, is you know, that it's an extremely important start. Um, and then as far as how we change the incentives, I mean, um, I think part of it is, is about elaborating and defining what counts as advertising. You know, what are the, what are the so societally acceptable, you know, business models for you know manipulating people's psychology like we don't really have a good answer to that right now um and part of it is we don't you know have a good sort of grammar of the types of influence um and part of it is that you know legal and regulatory systems are still catching up um but yeah but th th i think th that's one way of doing things i mean i think there are some precedents we could use to to you know to get footholds in in this space uh, uh so like, for instance, the, um, you know, like the spam, anti-spam regulation, anti-spam laws. So we said, okay, you can't just like send a bunch of messages to people en masse um, into their inboxes because it overloads their inbox. But, you know, there's, there's a, a very relevant sense in which that's similar to all of the, you know, stimuli, all of the ads coming at us, in, you know, into our attentional inboxes every day. Uh, so that's one. I mean, another a similar example would be like um, the kind of the do not, what do they call them? Like kind of do not call or anti robo call uh, legislation, where you can't just have a machine call somebody's home phone and you know give them some message about a political candidate or something. Um, so we've said, okay, these spaces are you cannot be invaded um, by these different kinds of messages, these different forces, um, and so you know. We had to define that. We had to say that you know this is not acceptable. So, I think we need to do something like that, except almost for our our mental space or the space of our our lives. So, so I think there are some precedents there we could we could start with. Um, and I mean, I think actually I might even have it in the book, but it was a quote by I want to say it was Vance Packard, the, his book The Hidden Persuaders, where he says, you know, this is this is the privacy that is like the most outrageous that these you know, advertisers invade is like the privacy of our minds. So, um, so this idea of mental privacy, cognitive liberty, I think there's some, there's, uh, this domain is, I think, very ripe for uh, advancement in, you know, philosophy and law. It's, it's, I find it interesting that, that you keep saying that, that one of the main things that we need to work on is in the wording, because, you know, the, in the words, in the, in, the, in the descriptions, in the metaphors, because um, uh, one of the main characteristics of this industry that, you know, 
we call the technology industry, but in, in this case it's, it's definitely an advertising industry, is that they are the advertising industry and therefore they make the metaphors for all of us to leave, no? And so they have evolved into, into this um, perfect machine of creating metaphors that suggest the exact opposite of what they are, no? Like uh, the classic example being the cloud, uh, representing something that is the exact opposite of a fluffy, clean thing that is everywhere and is, mm, you know, <laughs> and can be accessed by everyone. And, um, and, and they use it to define, like, you know, a cluster of servers in a desert protected by guns and, and wire um, that creates a lot of uh, CO2 <laughs> and that nobody can access to. So, um, so that is uh, a problem that you can also see when, when, when people try to define what the problem is. And, and yet again, like, we're trying to decide whether or not they're technology companies or advertising companies. And I think, as I was, as I was listening to you, that is the same about profit profit and value, no? Like, we keep thinking about the things that apparently give them profit, which in this case is maybe data. <laughs> we keep thinking, I mean, when Mark Zuckerberg says that he doesn't sell data, he's actually right. Like, he's telling the truth. Um, what he sells is eyeballs, <laughs> no? We, we could say. But in a way, he's accumulating data, which is what gives him and his company value. <laughs> like, their true value is not in their selling, but in their accumulating of this data that turns into predictions and, um, and also into an like, impossibly powerful uh, political tool. So, um, thinking about what you were saying about everything, or even South Park was saying, everything is an ad now. I was talking to a friend uh, the other day that is um, counseling the European Commission on uh, political ads. And we have spent a whole week like trying to, trying to to, to make a circle about what constitutes a political ad these days, because we keep thinking that political ads are the things that appear on a surface, <laughs> no? Things that appear on a banner, or, you know, maybe not always on the street, maybe on top of a website, but we keep thinking that they have this sort of rectangular shape, and there's normally a face on them that is a politician that is asking you for something, or to not vote to someone else, but, uh, but this is not what political ads are these days. This is not how Facebook uses that data to create political ads. They are more like a weather, no? Like a meteorology around a person that shows a world, <laughs> that, that gives an impression of the world. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, we're to, if, you, if you think that the first step towards the recovery of this super powerful and misused uh, infrastructure is to define what's advertising and to regulate that advertising, how, I mean, what are the steps back <laughs> from this reality where people are surrounded by an advertising that is the world <laughs> as they see it? Yeah, I mean, you know, our categories for talking about advertising, you know, emerged in an environment where we had you know, a few main, like, kind of media and the advertising was this very neatly bounded off space. I mean, not always, but a lot of the time, you know, it was kind of this exception to the rule of the way that information was being delivered. Um, and I think just what's happened now is the boundaries, you know, the, the boundaries of around the ad have kind of dropped. And yeah, it, it, it's hard to tell what's an ad and what's not. I mean, I think to me, the, 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 the bigger, there's a bigger question, which I mean, will probably be a, something we always grapple with, but you know, what kinds of influence are are, are, you know, are, do we deem to be acceptable? Um, and so I think the question of what, what is an ad, what counts as an ad, and what kinds of ads are acceptable and when and where is almost a subset of that question. Um, so, so yeah, so I think it, it seems to me that the first we would want to just say, you know, what, what kinds of influence uh, in a political context do we not think is acceptable and, and why? Um, and then, you know, it might be that we, we need to jettison the word advertising, just um, maybe it just, it just doesn't have the same utility that it used to anymore. Um, so maybe we need a new vocabulary to talk about, you know, maybe, maybe it's based in the, is sort of the, 
the elements of our psychology that that the the persuasive message is speaking to. Maybe it's about the uh, you know the way in which uh, something is targeted to us. So there's all sorts of there's all sorts of really hard, complex questions. I think in in this uh, in this challenge of, of yeah redefining advertising and and then the broader question of what kind of influence is <laughs> what kind of psychological manipulation is acceptable yeah what influences you were saying before that you were working on a grammar of influence which i find fascinating because one of the first problems that i think i would find in in pursuing that 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 possible grammar is the fact that you cannot measure it uh like for instance uh, I think uh, we would be, it would be difficult to find um, something more studied and researched and, and you know, exposed and like, you know, biopsied, <laughs> if that is even a word, than uh, the 2016 election uh, where Donald Trump became the president of the United States. And yet, there is no way you can demonstrate that any of the results of all these investigations, um, uh, you know, convinced anyone to vote anything. I mean, it is very easy. I mean, it is easy if you have access, of course, um, to to say, well, all these people received this advertising at this day, um, you know, and they voted this. But 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 we don't have the technology or the ability or definitely the language to um, to translate <laughs> that that receiving that information into uh, what action came afterwards like so how how do you how do you produce a grammar without having the measuring tools for influence yeah I think that whole phenomenon of the 2016 election was was really interesting I mean um, I mean it's already I think very hard uh, for these unique one-time events um, you know if you don't have a counterfactual to compare it against it's hard to know you know st I think there's a bigger problem here about statistics and these one-time events like you know when they were saying this candidate has a 80% chance to win like I mean if you actually think about it like I actually don't know what that means you know um, so I, I think there is a so I, I think that there there's there's a, 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 a Issue there about just these one-time events and, and and finding you know determining causality, um, but I mean I, I think that with that that election I mean yeah like I, to me if I'm being totally honest it, it seems to me that like I think there were way bigger causal factors than than these you know examples that were talked about like on you know the you know Cambridge Analytica and these kinds of things um, I mean like I think really it. it there, a lot of these things gain, gain traction because there was just an interest in delegitimizing um, the outcome. And I, I think there's a way in which it, there's a model of the human, I think, that this kind of thinking, it is the case that you can persuade people extremely effectively, but it's also the case that people, you know, people aren't just like, you know, you don't just pull a lever and they do something. So I think there's a, there's a kind of model of the human that it is some, somewhat disturbing to me that, that uh, kind of has emerged from some of these ways of talking about um, you know, political elections, uh, you know, there's similar stuff with like the Brexit vote in the US, or sorry, in the UK. Um, but um, yeah, so so I think, again, I think this gets, gets at this question of like, so one part of, there's a question of what kinds of influence are acceptable and, and how do we talk about those? But then I think the sort of the, the, the other side of that is, um, you know, how do we talk about the human will? So what kinds of agency can we, um, you know, can we engage in meaningfully in the context of persuasion? Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a, a dance between all these influences in our lives and our own agency, and we still talk about it in this very binary way, you know, and it's, you know, it's like that phrase, guns don't kill people, people kill people, but in reality, it's it's the interaction is the thing, right? Um, and I think in, 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 in the same way, you know, there's an interaction between these persuasive influences and and us, our will, our agency, our values, and I think part of the the, the challenge of finding a grammar of influence, of talking about this stuff more clearly, will be. My intuition is that it, it will require us to get beyond that binary. Um, you know, like McLuhan talked about, you know, media as extensions of man, and there's this kind of the cyborg idea where 
you know, these aren't sort of, it's not like this antagonistic, you know, situation where there are these technologies and us, these influences in us, like they're extensions of us in a certain way. Um, and so I think the more that we can get beyond this binary way of talking about things, you know, move from a kind of entities to interactions based uh, discussion, I think, um, I think the better to, uh, to answer your question. Sorry. <laughs> it is, I think, by now, for now, it's a, it's a very unanswerable question. <laughs> I guess uh, we have to think about influence as, as something like humidity, no? that we can only mm. measure in like percentages yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and, and the change yeah. all the time. But I think the environmental metaphor, I think, is, yeah, it's definitely the right one, it seems to me. Um, it's, yeah, it's not just a single interaction, it's, it's the whole, the whole uh, environment of it all, yeah. So thinking now in more positive terms, um, there is, um, um, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the friend Benjamin Bratton always says that the worst thing about these platforms is not that they are evil, that they get, they get your data and all that, it's the fact that they are such a powerful machine and they produce useless results for anything that is not, you know, their commercial <laughs> empower, <laughs> empower uh, interests. Um, uh, which is a, his way of saying we have built uh, a, a, an uber powerful planetary scale computation machine that does things and could be doing better things <laughs> with that power. One of the things that I that I've been thinking a lot regarding AI, because of course we're talking about this technology companies that are advertising companies but are also like the big AI companies in the planet. Um, how AI is being um, persistently misused as a susti substitute for human intelligence, cognition, or decision-making, uh, mo mostly decision-making, and, um, and how it has proven time and time again to be actually very good at other things, which is diagnosing problems. Uh, like, for instance, uh, one of the good examples is Amazon has, uh, has tried several times to produce an AI that can hire women. <laughs> in the company because uh, as most platforms uh, uh, of this profile, they don't have enough women uh, working in the company and therefore their company culture suffers as a result. So they create this AI that is supposed to go through the CVs and come up with, you know, with a, with a proper ungendered, um, you know, optimized approach to, to the people they want in the company. And it never works because the AI becomes better and better at finding those little nuances in the CV uh, that will indicate the presence of a female and immediately discards them. And, um, but the fact that these results are proving one time and time again that the company's culture is producing this problem um, seems to me that AI is being misused, that AI could be also um, used as a diagnostic tool maybe for correcting or, um, or pointing out at all the grammar um, incoherences of the way we deal with this problem right now. Because, I mean, part of the problem is that we're, we, we bump into paradoxes all the time or into maybe f fictional paradoxes because they are more like contradictions <laughs> between the the gooey surface world of descriptions of the technology and what the technology actually does so they are not really paradoxical they are more like you know finding the the contradiction <laughs> over and over again and not knowing what to do with it so are you using <laughs> sorry very long uh, meandering to ask this are you using AI for producing a grammar of uh, uh, influence and per persuasion? I haven't been, but I, I might start now, now that you mentioned it. Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, I think that there is, um, uh, there is a, a potentially a really interesting use of, of, uh, of AI machine learning for, for that kind of thing. I mean, one thing that, that you know, machine learning is, can be very good at is, is kind of automating certain kind of lower order um, tasks. Um, uh, and so, you know, if it's a situation where we have, um, you know, uh, a very large number of, of, of data points, um, you know, but it's a very highly bounded environment, um, and, you know, we want to kind of, you know, we can very clearly say, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve? What's the outcome? Um, and then I think, you know, 
the chunking of different kinds of experiences, different chunking of kinds of technical mechanisms into, you know, the principal components of types of influence, I think could be a really interesting, uh, a really interesting approach. So, um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. We can go now. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I was thinking maybe like you, I think you mentioned AlphaGo in the book uh, at some point, and AlphaGo is a very interesting case because, I mean, not only is uh, trying to do something that was supposedly impossible, which is uh, beat humans at the game of Go, or at least beat <laughs> the best uh, Go players at the game of Go, and uh, but then in the process of beating the first uh, champion of Go and beating the second, a whole year went past where the machine was playing itself um, to the point that it went from having, a, I don't know, like a Den 9, which is I think the top maximum level of Go playing that you can have uh, as a human being, to jumping to a, I don't know, Den 15, uh, where no human being ever will, a will ever be able to, uh, to beat this machine. And so I wonder, because you focus so much on on finding the right goals uh, for these technologies. If we were able, I mean, because of course this is like oh, you just have to ask what you want, uh, as if you knew what you want all the time. So um, your grammar or influence, I guess, would also be necessary for producing <laughs> or at least. Um, stating the appropriate goals for these technologies to be working in our um, advantage instead of uh, our disadvantage? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see a, um, a system like, like an AI-based system being really useful for um, enabling a, like reflection on our intentions. Um, so, you know, like, one part of the problem is, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get sucked into using some service and, and you know, an hour, two hours will go by. And um, it, it would be interesting if there were some kind of system that could look at, look at behaviors, look at interactions we're having and say, hey, it looks like, it looks like you're getting sucked down the rabbit hole of an of a endless, you know, feed that's giving you variable rewards or whatever. Um, and, and raise that to your conscious awareness where, you know, if the system is trying to make it unconscious, it kind of helps make it conscious. So uh, in the same way, like a friend might, if they were sitting there and they like throw something at your head and being like, what are you doing? You've been on your phone for an hour, you know? Um, so I could, I could see a really useful practicality of a, of a system like that, uh, just an aid for reflection. I mean, it's staggering actually how little reflection the, these systems, you know, enable or even allow sometimes. Um, and then I think also another one, I think I talked about this a little bit in the book, um, you know, reflecting on our intentions, like, you know, what am I actually trying to do here? Why am I trying to do that? What's the higher level intention? Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, my ideal app maybe would be some kind of uh, system you could converse with and it would just keep asking you like, why, 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 you know? Um, you know, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do this? And then you eventually get sort of the, the network of your, your goals and intentions and then that becomes the thing that all the other technologies have to essentially respect when they interact with you. I think that would be, I think that would be a really good use of, of, uh, of AI for, for, for that kind of thing. Oh my God, I would be terrified of where that data would go to. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. I mean, there there would be privacy uh, considerations, but I mean, it's um, but it would also be the, the the kind of the stake in the ground by which I guess we could hold platforms accountable. Because um, right now, it's like if they persuade us, manipulate us in some direction, they can you know say, well, we didn't know what they really wanted. It's like well, because they didn't ask. So, um, so yeah, I I think that there would be a a real utility to that. Well, I think my time is ticking, so yes. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about something you said before, which is um, that you would like to see an attention rebellion movement, which is uh, both hilarious and totally obvious. I can't imagine why, why this hasn't happened yet. So if there was to be an attention rebellion movement, how 
how do you think they could go about uh, rebelling and maybe propagating their rebellion? Yeah, I mean, it's um, there's probably so many ways. I think, I mean, you know, like I think one of the biggest sort of actions people can take to vote against this whole system is is blocking ads. Um, so there, that might be the seed of some kind of broader project. Um, it's a good question. I think, I think I'd have to really think about it. I mean, if you look at what Extinction Rebellion has done, uh, you know, like things like, I guess, bringing awareness is kind of one aim. So, you know, the, the die-in at the British Museum, or whatever they did, um, where they all lie down like they're dead, you know, in the, in the, in the museum. Um, basically bringing awareness about the issue to, to, to people, you know, to be an education component. Um, some you know way of, of applying pressure at, at important pressure points in the legal other societal systems um, so I, th I think all of those things could be could be important i mean um, I mean you could argue that you know some of the like you know some of the kind of you know this this term has been used a tech lash in the last few years um, uh, you know I think you could argue that some of that is is a kind of de facto attention rebellion. Um, but again, the issues that, it, that the, the tech lash has dealt with, I think, are, are more diverse than just the attention issue. So yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I, I feel like it would, it would involve something about just helping make the point of like what, what we're giving up every time we give attention to one of these systems and every time they, they capture it from us. Um, like what's being actually, what's at stake is, is kind of our fundamental humanity, you know? Um, you know, and and the success of you know, arguably of you know the human, <laughs> the human project at least, um, you know, any reasonable human project in the near term. So that's a very long-winded way of saying I'd have to think about it. <laughs> um, no, but I mean we're going back to the Luddites, no? Because that's basically what they were complaining. They were not complaining that the machines were taking their jobs. They mm. were complaining that mm. the working in the machines was taking away their humanity. Right was turning, the, turning them into, mm -hmm. into parts of the machine, which is something I think a lot about when I go to Twitter. And I see that now it's super hard to tell the bots, just not because bots are so good at being humans, but because humans now are so good at being like mm -hmm. bots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming the, the dominant cognitive style of like journalism, of academia. I mean, yeah, it's... Um, it's, it's actually really scary. And um, actually, um, incidentally, on this term, the tech lash, so I'm kind of a, a geek for etymologies, and I looked up the etymology of the word backlash. Um, and it's interesting, so a backlash, I thought it would be something with a whip or something, but it, a backlash is actually, um, if you have a machine and there's the gears in the machine, um, the backlash is actually a little bit of extra space where the tooths of the gears meet. And it's that little bit of extra space that lets them kind of move a little bit, but that's actually what lets the machine as a whole move. Huh. So, so the, that little bit of space, it, you know, if it wasn't there, the, the machine would be locked in place and wouldn't be able to move at all. So the, the, the backlash is actually a necessary condition of the machine's functioning. And I thought there's, a, there's something kind of nice and poetic in that about, you know, because there's this tendency to think, you know, talk about technology criticism as though it's just coming down on technology or being just negative, but it's actually the thing that, you know, that's the necessary kind of, you know, response mechanism that enables the whole machine to, to continue moving in some reasonable way. So I thought there was something kind of nice in that fact. That is super interesting. It's like part of the recipe for just <coughs> moving on, moving forward. Um, well, if you see it in historical terms, it's definitely always there, no? That's always the case. Mm. Actually, we're now using this technology is the same way that we used to drink Coke when it had actual cocaine in it, or we used to eat and drink sugar before we knew it would kill us. <laughs> and the way we are now eating meat, <laughs> uh, the way we will probably not eat meat in the, in the not so distant future, I guess. But, um, but now we are, you know, in this point where we're trying to negotiate our addiction um, and trying to find ways to use the technology without getting diabetes from it. But I would, the last thing I wanted to ask you is, um, don't you feel that this, um, that this uh, backlash <coughs> comes with some sort of exhaustion? Like the, the same exhaustion that you get from, 
sorry, from um, from maybe like clicking brainlessly at 2 a.m. Uh, in your computer just because you can't stop doing it and go to bed. Uh, but after 10 years of this, like, don't you feel that the backlash, the real backlash is going to come from people just being sick of it, being tired, like mentally exhausted, absolutely, uh, you know, too, too cooked <laughs> in their brains, too, too burned out um, to keep doing it? Because, I mean, the Netflix CEO was saying, we're not competing with YouTube anymore, we're competing with sleep. And that probably would be their downfall. Yeah, I mean, it's like trying to give attention to these dynamics and articulate even what the problem is sometimes in a reasonable way is, is exhausting. And, and then, then on top of that, the you know, efforts to, to push back against it, to to keep keep the you know the ball rolling on various reform efforts it's yeah it's certainly it's certainly exhausting and i think that's that's one of the risks is that um you know at some point you know you know society might say ah, there's there's we have our cat videos like let's just go watch some cat videos and, <laughs> um and then there will be exhaustion i mean i think you know you know enshrined power you know exhaustion of Exhaustion of the uh, the rebel force is always something that the power that's you know currently enshrined is, is um, hopes for and if not kind of counts on. But I mean, I think it's I guess we just have to kind of learn to keep pushing through the fatigue or whatever. So. Well, also we're using the cat videos and everything else as anesthesia <laughs> to not to not be eaten by anxiety about you know the general state of affairs mm. and the affairs will eventually yeah. catch up. And I think another thing that is useful here too, I mean, is is like hope, like imagination. Like I think there's a kind of like negative feedback loop quality to you know a lot of these media systems we have now, and you know cynicism, fatalism is very fashionable, not just on this topic, but, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, the planetary crisis, to politics, all sorts of things. Um, and I, I think, and I've actually been really hardened, like, talking to some younger people. So, one of the, the great, uh, you know, surprises that came out of this book was the, um, uh, the president of Princeton, you know, every, every year he picks one book to assigned to the incoming class and uh, 2019 he, he picked my book and I, so that gave me this opportunity to go to Princeton and, and talk to um, their incoming class and you know I talked with a lot of them and it it gave me a certain kind of hope um, that you know th that the f this fashionable cynicism fatalism it's not it's not something we can sort of just assume will continue to be there there is a real desire for hopeful narratives for imaginative narratives um, on the part of of you know young people, not just young people, but um, and I think you know one of the things I think we can do to avoid exhaustion is is keep keep our eyes on some kind of hopeful narrative, and um, I think for everybody this will be different. But for me, it's actually uh, in, in space exploration, um, and you know we're in a space renaissance right now, and and yes, I mean there are a lot of uh, there are, you know valid objections about you know should there be these people with this much money you know, just engaging in a status competition. But at the same time, it, if it's moving our capacities forward for exploration, I, I think that that's something very, um, very hopeful, very optimistic. Um, I mean, the idea that there's a, a car in heliocentric orbit right now playing a David Bowie song, I mean, that just, I mean, at the end of the day, that's just kind of cool. So, so, so I think finding these, these, these narratives that give us hope um, and and I think there are so many to be found. It's just, you know, usually they're not they're not selected for by the dynamics of the attention economy. But um, but but I think finding those to me that's a, that's a very good way of of remembering why why we're doing any of this. Because I mean, it would be easy. We could, we could just stop and we could just go watch, you know, cat videos or Netflix or whatever. We, like, there's no reason. Like, we're all we're pushing all of this ahead for some reason it's in, and and so i don't know to me finding that the, finding that reason finding that that purpose whether it's a better world for our children or or you know advancing the human project everybody will be different but i think finding that and just keeping our eyes on that for me that's that's an important uh motivational piece
and all of it. So. Well, on that cheerful note, um, I think we're gonna wait. <laughs> We're going to open the, uh, the session for questions. Anyone has a question? Alguien tiene alguna pregunta para James? Nadie? Does anybody have a question for James? Nobody? Okay. We have a question here. Your talk, it was very nice. Um, I wonder whether, well, you talked about the, the attention economy, and I wonder whether the problem is n not so much the advertising and everything that counts as advertising as, uh, as uh, I don't know, as misinformation, for example, but also uh, this thing of showing something different, I mean, to, to be attentive to different things. Because uh, an advertising or a misinformation is, show to, is shown to some people but not others, so the information that is shown to different groups of people are different. So maybe the problem is not as much as, is n not as much the misinformation or this advertising or this attention economy, but the thing that uh, mm, showing different things to different groups. So th this is my question. What do you think about that? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this is, uh, this is a problem as well. I mean, the idea that, um, that people would, could be a completely different information environments such that, you know, people might have two completely different understandings of the same story or may even not even be thinking about the same stories. So then what does it mean to, you know, be part of the same community part of the same society if, if, we, if you know, we increasingly don't share a, a common reality. Um, so some, the filter bubble idea kind of gets at, at this, uh, this issue. So I think certainly this is uh, yeah, having a common you know, epistemic world, a common informational world is, is, uh, is very important for many of these things. So um, I think, it, it's, uh, I think it, it, in some ways it can be um, a result of of uh, the attention economy. So, if if it's just more effective to target information delivery at at particular people because you can, um, whether it's advertising or some other information, that can be one way, one means by which um, people's informational worlds get fragmented. So, I, th I think I see them both kind of existing as as part of the same the same broader problem. Yeah. Alguna otra pregunta? Any other question? You don't have any questions for your James? Mm -hmm. We have him here today, and it's a luxury to have him. Since no one asks, um, what companies are doing it right? Or companies, maybe organizations? Uh, I mean, of course, you've been part of the foundation of a uh, time well spent. Um, I don't think you are so involved with them at the moment anymore, because maybe you're focusing on your research in Oxford. Uh, but I wonder if you know you can you can think of other institutions, organizations, or definitely com companies, since we are dealing with a problem with an industry and not not an or. Um, um, was an, an industry devoted to um, to basically uh, advertising, but uh, having uh, changed the nature of the internet itself in the last ten years. So, who's doing it right? I mean, it's hard to think of any advertising companies that are doing it right, almost by definition. Um, I mean, it, w when I early on at Google, when I started, there was this, I think, chance to to sort of really go all in on intention-based advertising as opposed to attention-based advertising. But of course, in advertising now, it's kind of been, you know, most of it is attention-based advertising. Um, I mean, it's not a company in the same way, but I think, uh, you know, Wikipedia, I think, is really interesting. Um, you know, it, to, in one sense, because they're, 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 they're not so much even like a, a, a service or a platform as they are like a process, um, a process by which, you know, 
certain decisions can be made, standards can be created, and you can go on, you can see all of the standards by which information gets presented to you. And one of the big problems with you know, the attention economy is, is you don't even know why certain information is coming at you. Um, you don't know whose interests, whose incentives led to me seeing this thing as opposed to the millions of other things I might be seeing. So with Wikipedia, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a collective, um, organized, you know, transparent uh, process um, that, you know, you can, you can go and, and see. So I think, you know, it, you could imagine what that would look like for other kinds of, of systems, um, whether it's some kind of, you know, search engine or, um, you know, some kind of social network. Um, I, I know there are, I think there are visions for these, for a cert, this, cert kind of, this kind of thing with, uh, you know, things like federated social media or, um, you know, the free open software movement. Um, but I, I think in terms of, uh, yeah, advertising companies, I can't think of any that were really doing it, doing it right. Um, but, yeah, but I think Wikipedia would be interesting to think about as a model if you apply that to other, to other types of services, what it could look like. That's a very, very good example indeed. Well, I think, ah, oh, we have a question. <laughs> I love that example. I would like to see, for instance, how my Twitter uh, or Facebook timeline has been curated by uh, algorithms, uh, by, you know, showing me who has been betting for my words and, and for my attention. Uh, I like that. Another one I would mention, I guess it's, it, it's still, it's very new, but Substack, I think they're doing some really interesting things around, um, I mean, uh, getting away from an advertising-based business model for, uh, to enhance, like, kind of medium to long-form writing. Indeed. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much, James, and to you as well um, for this um, experience. And I have a doubt, I have many questions, I just don't have the courage to mention them all, or I even need to process so much information. But when you were talking about AI, you mentioned that it would be interesting to have or create some kind of um, responsive uh, something that will um, go deeper and ask why, 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 and take you into maybe more deeper answers. And then I thought, so you're putting, is it for you AI will be, it will be superior, superior in the answer that it will reach a superior answer that just your human consciousness, your human awareness, as, as if you go in, in deep within you without the need of a device or an artificial intelligence. Do you think that the AI could be equivalent? It will reach that place where it will be equivalent to the uh, human consciousness? Do you, am I making myself clear? It's because I'm... <laughs> yeah, it's, it just brought to me this, that, that you, you, you were interested in finding this thing that would tell you why, why, why. What, where, where will you expect to, to take you to? Is, is it not something that you will be able to reach this place by yourself by inquiring within you? Mm. Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. So I would say, so the way I think of it is this, you know, the way we know what we want um, is often by reflecting on it. And so that reflection can happen a number of ways. It could be that, you know, I'm sitting in my room at home just talking out loud, looking in the mirror or something. Or it could be that I'm talking with a friend or, you know, going to a, you know, personal coach or a therapist or... Um, you know, it, 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 there's a number of ways of, of, you know, externalizing and then reflecting on. And, and sometimes, you know, I, in the same way, I don't, sometimes I don't know what I mean until I, I hear myself saying it. Um, sometimes I don't know what I really want and what I'm going for until I explain it to a friend and have them, you know, reflect back various things. And so the idea, I guess, I was going for there was just that, you know, th th there could be some kind of AI 
service that, you know, it wouldn't even have to be very, very, it wouldn't even have to use AI. I mean, I could, you could even just encode the techniques of motivational interviewing into a chatbot or something. Um, but it, it, if it was just one other option for that external reflection where, uh, you know, if it just asked you why, then it, that's, that's this external prompt for you to then can kind of continue that process of reflection. So um, I, I don't think it would, you know, on the whole be better than talking to a therapist or a friend. There would probably be unique unique benefits to doing it with a, a AI system. You know, if, if you think of something in the middle of the night and you don't want to call your friend or your therapist, then you could talk to this thing. But um, so I think there would be unique benefits, also unique drawbacks. But um, it could just be one more one more system for reflecting on our, our intentions. Um, actually, I have a three-year-old son, and he's just now gotten in this mode of literally literally everything I say, he says, well, why? You know, I think Louis C.K. has a great bit about this. Like, <laughs> he kind of goes more and more meta. But, um, but actually then, like, you know, he'd ask me, well, like, why is the sky blue? And like, oh, yeah, let me open up a science book or Google it, and you know, I learned things I didn't learn before. So, so this kind of, like... Uh, dyadic reflection is, is core to a lot of different uh, things, whether it's, you know, self-knowledge or learning about facts of the world or whatever. So, so that was what I was roughly going for there. Funny enough, Why is the Sky Blue was the first ad that Google came out with uh, in Google Sense that would come up with they didn't know anything about you. <laughs> when they didn't know what to show, instead of showing you cars or, uh, I don't know, cosmetics or dresses or something like that, oh. like the Why is the Sky Blue would appear and you would click on it and it will tell you. <laughs> Which oh. I think it's very nice to cover that space. <laughs> So maybe if I saw it, I would erroneously think I was being hyper-targeted with some intelligent AI, <laughs> it would just be the default one. Exactly. Yeah. But that, that question you asked, I really liked because um, it also reminded me of the end of Hair, this uh, Spike Jones movie, where at the end, and I'm sorry if this is a spoiler, <laughs> but he gets dumped <laughs> because, you know, his operating system goes with other OSs that are basically in a high, higher state of consciousness. <laughs> it's like the Earth is better and yoga than he is, I guess. Um, well, I think this is a wrap. Vamos a cerrar la sesión. Y we are going to be wrapping up the session today. The foundation has uh, some space at the entrance where you came in through uh, for him to sign, sign your books. Please do not uh, come to the stage because while we are through this going through this period of using face masks or not it's better if we do not get too close but um we're going to remove the mics and uh, put on our face masks and you can bring your books for the author to sign them for you i'm very glad that you came to madrid uh and that i was here <laughs> on time to see you and talk to you i hope your uh grammar uh comes out um in in a, in a in a you know a, a fast enough fashion that uh we can at least uh, slow down the effects of this attention economy in all of us or maybe just on me and um well I'll see you all at the, you know, on, on the way. This is the last event <laughs> of the summer uh, in, in el espacio Fundación Telefónica. Así que os veremos todos. So we will be meeting you all after the summer. I wish you all a great summer and thank you. And thank you for the foundation for inviting us today. Thank you.